uh, I'll start with the intros. So good luck, everybody. Okay. Quick welcome message. I already got people raising their hands. It's great. So uh, while people are getting there, um, getting settled in, uh, I assume audio is all taken care of, but uh, just wanted to cover a few technical details about this platform in particular before we get started. This is Zoom webinar. It's not Zoom meeting. So your cameras and your microphones are disabled by default. So you don't need to worry about interrupting us or anything like that. But if you do want to get our attention, you can raise your hand and I'll just send you a quick chat to see if you have an issue. Uh, but otherwise, in terms of interacting with our panelists today, there's two main ways you can do it. You can use the chat. And if you use the chat, just make sure that you select all panelists and attendees if you want everyone to see it, like if you want to have some kind of discussion. Uh, otherwise, it's going to default to just us. If you have a question for the panel, uh, I would recommend highly that you use the Q&A function. It makes it a little bit easier for us to manage. And on top of that, everyone else can see it by default. They can upvote it if they think it's a good question and they can actually even add their own comments. So it's a nice way to interact with everybody on topic. Uh, so without further ado, I wanna hand it off to uh, Bill Gill. Thanks, Mike, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of the, your afternoon to share uh, some time with, with us. Um, my name is William Gill. Everybody calls me Bill, and I'm the Director of Government Relations here at ACRO, and I've been in this position for about four years. Um, and I am Michelle Mott, Associate Director of Government Relations and Communications, and I have been at ACRO for about 12 years, I think. <laughs> So she's like she's an institution here at Acro in Washington D.C. So um, let's get going. It, it's a um, it should be a fun uh, fun session for everybody. So where do we let, where do we start? Um, before we jump fully in into priorities, let's let's kind of really get a, um, a sense of what the atmosphere here is in Washington and what is President Biden kind of uh, what's his reality? Well, um, the, the truth of the matter is that he's got very little wiggle room in regards to majorities uh, in both the House and the Senate. Um, as we know, there are 435 members of Congress in the House. There are two, 221 Democrats and 211 Republicans. And you'd be like, well, that doesn't add up to 435, Bill. Uh, what We're missing four. Um, and the reason is we're missing three and the reason is it actually was uh 210 but one just got resolved on monday so they um uh, there was a recount up in upstate new york and that was the winner was declared to the republicans so that's why it came to 221. um cedric Rich richmond uh is leaving his position so there's special elections happening he's joining the administration um and two members of congress uh passed away um from COVID. Uh, one, Ron Wright, uh, passed away just a couple days ago, and the other one, uh, Luke Leto, uh, passed away um, on December 29th before he could be sworn into office. So we have a couple of special elections that are still going to happen, so that's how we're going to get to 435. Notwithstanding, so at the end, we're probably looking at 222 to 213. That's not much of wiggle room for anybody to try to govern. In the Senate, as we all know, we have a 50 50 split with Vice President Harris uh, being the tie breaking vote. So that's what kind of what's the makeup of Congress. Uh, and, uh, and what does that transpire uh, tra mean for the Education Committee uh, membership? So in the House, um, we have the Education and Labor. The chair is once again uh, Bobby Scott. Um, then the Democrats have 28 individuals. Uh, and the, uh, for the Republicans, uh, we have once again, Virginia Fox, she's the ranking member. And those two have been at the top of the committee for, oh, I would say a good decade, depending on who, um, which party is in power. But the Republicans have 22 individuals. That number should actually be 24. Um, but as I mentioned, Ron Wright uh, passed away recently. He was a member of the committee. 
and also you probably have heard little once or twice that this one individual uh marjorie taylor green may have been stripped of her committee assignments uh so that that's where the two uh, the, the 24 there is a subcommittee uh in the in the house and the higher education and workforce and investment subcommittee is now have a new chair because Congresswoman Susan Davis retired from Congress. The new chair of this subcommittee is Representative Frederica Wilson uh, from Florida, and the ranking member is Greg Murphy uh, from North Carolina. In the Senate, uh, the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, also widely known as just the Health Committee, we have uh, Senator P Patty Murray returning, the, uh, leading the Democrats, and with the retirement of Senator Alexander, we have a new uh, Republican in charge of the Republican side. And that individual is uh, Richard Burr from, uh, he's the ranking member from North Carolina. Interesting to note, this is a perfect example of, of it's gonna be interesting how we're gonna have shared governance. Because on every committee, as we know, we have a 50-50 split, but the vice president has the vote. Uh, so it gives a majority in quint theory to the Democrats. But they also have an equal split in committee assignments or committee representatives. So in the, while the ranking, uh, while the chair is Ms. Murray and ranking member is Mr. Burr, both Democrats and, and Republicans will both have 11 individuals on that, on the Senate Health Committee. And that's gonna happen in every committee. Um, the other thing that's kind of going on is um, the Biden administration is just starting to, just trying to get people in place. Um, Things take time, and it's going to be a while before uh, they're going to really start being able to govern effectively at the at the administrative level and within the agencies. Put it in perspective, um, there are about 1,200 congressional appointed positions. I think as uh, couple days ago, only six have been confirmed to date, and uh 45 individuals have been nominated so there's a huge they have to do a lot of work over these next couple months if they're really going to be up and running kind of by the summertime within the department of education we saw that um, miguel cardona um is uh is the, was uh, nominated by the president to be the next secretary of education he had a hearing last week um he came out of committee fairly unscathed and now he is still uh, nominated, uh, secretary nominated, simply because there he, he has not been voted upon by the full Senate, which so be confirmed. There has been no no individual nominated to be the undersecretary for higher education yet, and we have our nose to the ears to the ground trying to see if there's any rumors, but nobody really in the higher ed community has kind of heard of any kind of leading contenders. In the meantime, um, <clears throat> the, the administration has put in Michelle Asia Cooper, who is uh, who was the who was the president of the Institute for Higher Education Policy or HIHEP, to be the uh, acting assistant secretary for post secondary education, um, and that's kind of an acting job in order to get things moving. Um, because if she waited until what her official title is, is she's, she was nominated as a deputy assistant secretary for higher ed programs in the office of the post-secondary um, education and department. Um, nobody really be, would be doing anything at the department. <laughs> in addition, um, the administration has also uh, put in place Jessica Montega Morgan. And she will be the senior advisor at the, uh, the, to the undersecretary of education. Again, they're doing this in order to start getting some of the wheels moving since they don't have anybody, they don't even have a secretary yet. Um, and she can, she comes from, she's a alumnus of the Warren, um, uh, Senator Warren um, office. She actually was the lead education individual for Senator Warren when, uh, for her presidential bid. So let's talk about, um, next one, Mike. So let's talk about some um, something that uh, that uh, the Biden administration has done. And with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle. Right. Uh, so since taking office, President Biden has signed over 40 executive orders um, and actions, 17 on the first day. 
The directives highlight the new administration's immediate priorities, some of which do impact higher ed. One of the first orders signed um, rescinded the travel bans on several African and predominantly Muslim countries. The order offers some relief for students from the affected countries, but there's still a lot of lingering questions regarding international student travel. Um, ACRO has reached out to the administration to push, to push for further actions to support international students. That includes allowing new international students to attend online programs in the US during the pandemic, restoring duration of status, repealing rules limiting H-1B visas, preserving the optional practical training program, ensuring timely processing of visas and other things. Um, earlier this month, Biden signed another order directing agencies to review existing policies that may be impeding legal immigration. That includes student visas and pathways to permanent residency. So we're hopeful that additional actions and guidance is forthcoming. Another day one executive order preserved and fortified the DACA program. Again, this provides temporary relief for recipients, um, but the program is being challenged in the court system. Texas and eight other states have asked a federal judge to end the program, arguing that its creation through executive order was unconstitutional. So that challenge puts pressure on Congress to act on a more permanent solution. On day one in office, Biden also released an immigration reform bill with a pass to citizenship for 11 million undocumented immigrants. It was welcomed by Democrats, um, but Republican support remains limited, making passage, especially in this con Congress, more difficult. The next order revoked a Trump policy prohibiting federal contractors and grant recipients from conducting race or sex stereotyping. Um, that included diversity training. The policy obviously created a lot of confusion on campuses, especially at a time when many um, were working to address the racial protests across the nation. Biden's order revokes that policy and instead directs agencies to work toward advancing racial equity. Um, however, we don't know exactly what that will result in at this time. Biden's directive on student loans continues the existing pause on monthly interest and principal payments for federally held student loans until at least September 30th of this year. The policy continues to exclude those loans that are federally held but backed by um, private lenders. And although this is not part of the executive order, we've gotten a lot of questions regarding emergency funds in the latest stimulus package. So um, a quick update on that. The recent package approved in December does provide more flexibility on how institutions can spend emergency funds than last spring's CARES Act. Um, updated guidance from the Education Department in December also allow, now allows more students to receive emergency student grants. Um, that includes those that are not eligible for financial aid because of poor grades or defaulting on student loans. Um, however, it still remains unclear whether Grants can be used to help undocumented students, DACA recipients, or international students. So ACRO has reached out to urge the department to clarify that those grants can be used for all students. Um, finally, Biden signed yet another day one executive order that builds on last year's Supreme Court ruling on LGBTQ workers' rights. The order asserts that Title IX's protections based on sex also extend to sexual orientation and student identity identity, um, which offers students more robust protections. Citing that executive order, Biden officials also revoked a last minute Trump memo um, that sought to limit the scope of the Supreme Court's decision. And we anticipate that the new administration will take additional actions um, and again, potentially issue further guidance similar to the Obama administration to further protect LGBTQ students' rights moving forward. Next slide. So we, we can see that the Biden administration is taking a lot of executive action. Um, they're trying to get up to speed and try to get their people in place to talk about the various agencies to provide guidance and, and leadership. Um, and we're kind of breaking this out for the next portion and, and it's kind of like some immediate short-term priorities for the Biden administration. And then we'll talk about some kind of the long-term ones. Um, I did want to kind of make a comment on, on what uh, Michelle said about the uh, December omnibus bill. And, um, just to clarify, uh, the 
the, um, the language in that provides a lot more flexibility to institutions on how they can use those monies because previous guidance from the administration, um, the previous administration was limited to the fund, those funds could only be used to Title IV eligible individuals, um, leaving out a whole bunch of individuals. And I should also note that that uh, emergency act that was included in December also included about 23 billion uh, for institutions of higher education but still falls way short from the 120 billion, which uh, the higher ed community had asked. So if you haven't heard, um, there's something called the American Recovery Act and it's uh, that the Biden administration has put forward. And that's a $1.9 trillion package. Um, within it, it has, it's calls for 170 billion for education, 130 billion for K through 12 schools and 40 billion for higher ed. Um, when it initially came out, uh, there was an issue with some of the language because it initially, uh, well, until it officially changed, but the language in there uh, would prohibit uh, private uh, nonprofits to be able to use any of the funds or be eligible for any of the funds. So obviously we, the higher ed community, uh, have been talking with uh, members of uh, the committee, and I know that a whole bunch of your institutions that are a private nonprofit have always been reaching out to members of of Congress to let them know that uh, that's changes, and they have given us uh, assurances that private uh, nonprofits will continue uh, will be eligible for those funds. So, um, whenever and uh, what final pack packages looks like. But the final question is, will it pass, and how? Um, Republicans um, have already said uh, too much. That's that's way too much. And the Biden administration has a little bit of an issue um, because recently uh, Larry Summers, the former uh, Treasury Secretary for the Obama administration has come out saying that that would actually um, be too much and would actually create inflation for the market uh, for the United States. So you have that. And then at the also, uh, it should also be noted that you guys may, may know that um, to counter the 1.9 uh, uh, trillion, the Republicans also put out their own relief package, and that was in the amount of 634 billion. Nothing, nothing for nothing within it for higher education, and you probably saw that it was 10 senators that went over and talked with uh, with the president uh, last week. Um, so. The hope of the administration was that this would be uh, be able to pass on a bipartisan, what we call here regular order, meaning um, uh, uh, filibuster proof, sixty votes in uh, sixty votes in the Senate, um, and then just by you know majority rule in the House would be a bipartisan, because um, because they didn't they wanted to save reconciliation for something later on down the line. Um, it, um, but it, the more time passes, it certainly seems like they are have no other uh, choice but to go down the reconciliation route. And just so it's really complex and it's very, very used provision. So I'm going to explain to you guys what is reconciliation and how does it work. Uh, should be noted, um, liability protection for uh, institutions higher ed is not included in the American Recover Act. And I don't think it's going to be included in any measure that, that comes out. So what is recon, uh, recon, uh, reconciliation? It should be noticed that it's been usually used uh, in the past to cut spending. Um, but now is being used to kind of pass large, significant uh, legislation. The most important thing is that it's not subject to a filibuster, which we you know we need to have a uh, minimum 60 senators uh, to be able to uh, get passage um, can only be used on spending, revenue, and federal debt limit. And the and Senate can only pass one bill per year affecting each subject or up to three per year. Um, and it should be noted that reconciliation was how the Trump tax cuts uh, were passed. And also, that was the vehicle why the Republicans tried to strip some of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. And as you may recall, um, it was Senator McCain coming up, coming up dramatically and going like that on the Senate floor. So um, 
it's a very complicated, not widely used, not not that commonly used. And so dive a little bit more because now the, the bus has started to leave this, uh, the station, the train started to leave the station. And the first thing that needs to happen is that a budget resolution got to be identical in both the House and Senate needs to be passed by both chambers. What this budget resolution essentially is, sets up the parameters or um, uh, for the package or what the overall amount will be. And so um, the House uh, is going to most likely going to take up the the Senate's the Senate version. Um, they passed it last Friday after a voterama at finally at 5 a.m. So the budget resolution has been passed in the Senate and now it's going to be sent over to the House. So once it's passed in both chambers, respective committees will need to write up uh, their section. So, for example, the health committee will write up everything that has to do with education and Ed and Labor will write up their the $170 billion uh, legislation for their portion of the expenditures. Again, 130 for K through 12 and 40 billion for higher ed. Um, once passed, each committee sends their portion to the budget committee, who then rolls it all up and not appropriators, but the budget committee, and then it's sent to the floor to the floor vote uh, as a single omnibus bill. And again, it must be identical in both chambers. Um, the Senate will be slower to get to get their stuff together than be sent over to the budget committee um, because they are dealing with impeachment. Um, some say it could be over by this weekend. Maybe some may roll over till next week. But the expectation is that they're working with the end of February deadline to kind of roll it all up and, and to get their sections in. Um, and they probably expect to vote in early to mid-March um, for the $1.9 trillion American Recovery Act. And that is important because on March 14th, um, unemployment benefits run out. So that's the timeline that we're looking at. Also of note is that appropriators recently announced that earmarks will now be allowed once again for many, 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 many years. Earmarks were not allowed. And the history and the theory behind that is because um, this will uh, provide some flexibility to the Democrats to be able to control um, key votes with the members and to um, kind of be on the lookout for that. And then again, there's other short-term priorities that we were talking about. They have 1,200 positions to fill that need the confirmation. Uh, only announced 42, and um, you know confirmed six or seven. So that's that's really a lot of their short-term uh, focus. Next slide, please. Some of the long-term priorities for the Biden administration. Um, Again, they're already the first one hasn't even passed, and they're already talking about a second supplemental of of, of nearly three trillion. And some of the things being discussed in there are kind of a student loan forgiveness, possibly, and some uh, maybe free college. Uh, some of those things, some big, big, big ticket uh, items. Um, they're definitely talking about more funding for HBCUs and MSIs, and. I'm finally mentioning HEA reauthorization 23 minutes into this presentation. I, I would normally, that's probably the number one thing that everybody wants to hear about, where are we on HEA reauthorization? So there's, um, where are we? Um, <laughs> I think it's gonna be very complicated from my perspective. Again, it has to be a fully bipartisan uh, uh, House and Senate uh, legislation. We have seen, um, two different various HEAs over the last two Congresses being passed by the uh, House Education Committees, two very different, one being led by the Republican two Congresses ago, one being led by Democrats, they, they are polar opposite. Um, they left committee, they never even saw the floor. And in the Senate, we, um, we never even saw anything and, um, and um, as I mentioned, there are 11 members for both Republicans and Democrats. So that's truly gotta be a bipartisan uh, effort. So, and th the other thing is 
the a loss of Senator Alexander. Um, that's that's a huge that's a huge. Uh, Mr. Burr is not necessarily completely interested in not necessarily interested. You know, everybody's interested, but. Um, in comparison to Senator Alexander, who was there and was you know, a Secretary of Education, uh, President of a university, who, somebody that truly understood um, higher ed in in the in the sense of the you know what are what what are institutions really like. Shall? Um, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> Um, some of the other long term priorities for the Biden administration include an extensive plan to make colleges more affordable. That includes doubling the maximum Pell Grant to close to $14,000. Um, this could be more easily accomplished. The Pell pro program is popular on both sides of the aisle, um, doesn't need new authorizing legislation to add funding, but the program will be very expensive. His plan also calls for broader debt relief for student loan borrowers. That would include limiting repayments to no more than 5% of discretionary income and loan forgiveness for borrowers currently in repayment programs after 20 years. Um, but there are other calls for broader loan forgiveness measures. Biden's plan would include a proposal seeking congressional approval to forgive at least $10,000 of debt for certain borrowers. Meanwhile, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and other progressive Democrats have urged Biden to use executive authority to forgive up to 50,000 of debt um, for all borrowers. But the president has repeatedly expressed doubt that he has the executive power to do so. Um, and it appears that the administration is leaning towards Congress as opposed to executive action um, to accomplish this one, which will be difficult to accomplish in this Congress again. Republicans are opposed to the idea, and even some Democrats are skeptical, um, favoring plans that address affordability, affordability more comprehensively. One such Michelle, plan- let me, let me, uh, Michelle, let me jump in real quickly. To put it in perspective, these are also um, huge, huge ticket items. For example, the doubling the Pell, um, you know, it, it would increase uh, funding to about $30 billion per year. And that's over 300 billion over 10 years. And again, um, that, the limitations of reconciliation, um, some some of the, the for loan forgiveness, you know, even 10,000 will cost the 350 uh, billion. Um, 50 and 50,000 uh, Schumer's 50,000 would cost 900 billion dollars. So these are big, big, big ticket items. Good. Mm. Okay. <laughs> um, free community college. So um, Biden has called for two years of tuition free community college through a federal state partnership um, with the federal government contributing 75% of the cost. That would include part time students, adult learners, and DACA recipients who are often left out of the state free college programs. Um, again, the plan will be expensive complex to design and difficult to implement um, and is more politically controversial because it would leave out some, uh, some, would leave some schools out. On the regulatory side of things, the new education secretary will likely look to review the new Title IX rules um, and restore the Obama era borrower defense and gainful employment rules. This proce process is expected to take a long time though um, the department is working with far fewer staff than four years ago, and as Bill has mentioned, it will take time for the administration to fill certain positions um, that remain. Beyond that, there are a lot of other questions on this topic. Um, will the administration simply reinstate Obama-era guidance? Will it repeal and immediately replace the rules? Or will it repeal and take the time to formally rewrite the rules, which then leaves the question of what will follow, um, of what to follow in the interim? So we'll be following these matters very closely and we'll update the membership as any develops, uh, developments take shape. Any additions, Bill? Nope, that's good. Um, obviously, we're, we will be tracking a lot of things. We've been extremely busy. I mean, we mean higher ed, trying to make sure that the current administration uh, provides clarity on a whole bunch of series of uh, issues. And we've been sending I don't know, Michelle, what? But, well, I apologize. Uh, 
episode, Bill's dog made a cameo. <laughs> hey, Wilson. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's my that's my Beagle Wilson. Um, um, so um, I think what Michelle, we saw probably like I think we sent like seven or eight letters in the last two weeks, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Meaning higher ed, higher ed. But um, some of the other issues that we'll be tracking is. Um, I have, we listed um, HA um, reauthorization in in terms of of making sure that we have markers out there, um, markers in regards to whenever we get to it, um, our issues are already addressed, and there's um, there's um, so they'll be incorporated into whatever final uh, measure that comes out of HEA. There are two that we have um, where we're going to probably have legislation associated with it are going to be our reverse transfer legislation, which we've had it um, introduced for the last two Congresses. Um, essentially, um, uh, we would be, um, we will um, reverse transfer, basically, we would, we would uh, add an additional exemption under PURPA by, uh, by which a, a four year could share with a two year um, institution and individuals um, education record for the um, for the analysis to see if an individual um, has enough credits to at least get an uh, associate's degree. Um, we have to find a new lead because uh, Congresswoman on the committee, Congresswoman Fudge is now going to be the secretary of HUD. So we need to find a new individual. And but notwithstanding, I've, I've got a meeting scheduled with committee staff to talk about Perspective uh, leads of uh, individuals who they think would, would be the, would, would take up this legislation, and then the other uh, is uh, purple legislation associated to ensure that an electronic record is part of an education record uh, and is covered under FERPA. Um, I know that we know that members treat it that way, and but right now there are, there's been some um, lawsuits that have created some confusion around this issue. And and we just want to make sure that all electronic records are are for sure part are are covered on the FERPA as a, and it's part of an education record. Um, so and it's covered by it. so that those are the two uh, legislative priorities that that we have um, under uh, FERPA regulations. Um, you may remember at our meeting uh, we were told two years ago in the Orlando annual meeting that there would be uh, some there was sort of a rewriting of FERPA regs. We know that the previous administration uh, worked on this. We know that it was drafted up and it was almost being sent over to OMB. Um, the way things work is that around here, if you don't know, is that every federal agency that wants to make a change or wants to get comments or everything, it has to be clear first by OMB and then it's published in the federal register. Um, it was getting ready to be sent into over to OMB, but it wasn't for whatever reason. We're not sure. We don't know what's in it. Um, we don't, uh, so um, we don't also don't know, uh, and since nobody's at the department right now, uh, we don't know what the plan are going to be for that uh, for, for regulatory, but we will obviously be tracking that extremely uh, closely. The um, we're also tracking uh, federal privacy uh, legislation. As you guys know, there's been uh, many states that have, that have um, submitted over 30 that have um, proposed privacy legislation. And we know that um, it is really focusing on the big giants, such as the Google, the Microsoft of the world and everything like that. But uh, our institutions could be adversely impacted by this as well. And so we're tracking that on a federal uh, federal level. Um, for example, during last Congress, there were two different uh, privacy bills that were introduced in the Senate, one from Mr. Wicker, uh, S4626, and another one by Senator Cantwell, Senator uh, S2968. Um, and they're vastly different. We would, uh, ACRO's perspective, we would prefer uh, the language 
that uh, is the is in Washington State legislation has passed, and recently the House in Virginia passed similar legislation where essentially um, entities that are covered under FERPA would be exempt from the from the regulatory uh, actions required under these privacy legislation. So um, under the Wicker bill, uh, FERPA and HIPAA are exempt. Under the Cantwell bill, the, they kick it over to the FTC um, to make a determination of if, what, in, what entities or areas are exempt from, pri from overall privacy. Our concern is obvious that number one, FTC changes every couple of years. So it's up to subject all the time. And number two, more concerning is you could have possibly two competing privacy legislations that could be contradictory to another and would cause a tremendous uh, confusion an institution. So you would have the FTC's interpretation and then you would have FERPA. And so that to us, that's a very large concern. Uh, ACRO has been leading the discussion around this. Um, We've had several conversations. We actually have met with uh, the Four Corners, meaning the lead committee staffs of the Commerce Committee in both the Republicans, the Democrats, House and Senate um, to express our concerns. They had heard from other sectors, but had not heard from, from the higher ed. So they were appreciative of that. They were aware of purple, but they didn't really kind of think all through about the possible ramifications. And uh, we are having discussions uh, with just a, we're also part of the five or six different higher ed associations that could um, be impacted by something like this. Obviously ours is very focused on impact of FERPA, but other uh, associations could be impacted as well uh, during for their members and um, what it could mean to them. So we're working with the higher ed community in that regard. Michelle? Okay. Um, and we'll keep kind of bouncing around these issues a little bit. Um, community colleges with First Lady Jill Biden in the White House, community colleges can expect to see increased support at the federal level. Um, the president's higher ed platform refers to community colleges over 30 times. And just yesterday, Dr. Biden spoke at the Community College National Legislative Summit, reaffirming the administration's plan to make community colleges free, as we discussed, um, as a way to rebuild the nation's economy. The administration's plans also include uh, $8 billion to help community colleges update their technology and a new, a, a new grant program um, to help increase retention and completion. And that can be used to improve advising, transfer policies, articulation agreements, um, staffing, and more. Um, additionally, as we discussed earlier, the Biden administration will also work to combat discrimination against members of the LGBTQ community. ACRO has been an advocate for inclusivity around gender expression and sexual orientation for some time. Um, and we do look forward to working with the new administration to advance these issues at the federal level. Um, another issue um, that we are following pertains to the recently passed Protect the GI Bill Act. The legislation includes a number of provisions that aim to protect student veterans and their education benefits but we're concerned that some, of, that some other measures are gonna be problematic for student vet, veterans and institutions. Um, first, there is a change that makes institutions responsible for repaying the VA for overpayments um, that result from changes to a veteran's enrollment status. This was effective January 5th. Previously, when a veteran dropped a class or withdrew from a program, the VA treated that as debt owed by the veteran back to the institution. Um, now institutions are responsible for paying, <laughs> for paying back this debt, um, effectively putting all of you in the position of becoming the VA's debt collector. This change could also prevent veterans with outstanding debt to the institution from re-enrolling or um, potentially obtaining a transcript to continue at another institution. Another one of the provisions which takes effect August 1st requires dual certification for the receipt of GI Bill benefits. Um, so institutions will need to certify enrollment after the ad drop date, and then students will be required to verify their continued enrollment each month after that. Um, according to the legislation, if a student fails to recertify for two consecutive months, the VA will withhold their monthly housing allowance payments until the student recertifies. 
Um, ACRO, and again, the broader higher education community had pushed to remove these provisions from the legislation, um, but unfortunately they were included in the final bill, so institutions will need to comply moving forward. Yeah, so those provisions, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the changes of provisions are, are scheduled to go into effect in September, um, except the provision regarding overpayment, that went into effect uh, January 5th. So institutions already um, uh, have to comply with that, with that requirement. Um, one aspect that ACRO was successful in making sure that was not included in the in the legislation was to was it would have been the requirement to um, the institutions monthly certify the enrollment of students uh, of these uh, veterans in, in institutions. And one we were concerned for the we, uh, they already have to by law be required institutions to report back to uh, the VA within 30 days if somebody's not enrolled in an institution and also the current system that the um, the institutions have to use for veteran reporting is is to say antiquated and it's called ba once um and it's and it's and individuals have to manually insert this information every semester and so can you imagine doing that every month and so um we explained to them that this would be um, burdensome and kind of double repetitive since institutions have to report if the veterans not enrolled within 30 days after their drop. Okay, um, and then one final issue that we will continue to track is um, regarding ban the box guidance. Um, so we have and will continue to advocate for congressional action to codify the Obama administration's beyond the box guidance. Um, that guidance issue was issued in 2018 and provides recommendations to institutions to remove criminal history questions from their applications. Um, it mirrors guidance developed by an ACRO work group concerning the use of student criminal history in the college admissions process. Um, the Trump administration had moved to require the Education Department to share that guidance, showing some bipartisan agreement on the issue. Uh, and we do anticipate that the Biden administration will also take steps probably later down the road, but to further advance the guidance and hopefully urge Congress to take action. And the final impact, uh, the final um, thing we want to bring up is that, as you may or may not know, uh, in the San River Omnibus, um, COVID relief package, the, and as a parting gift for Senator Alexander, there was a huge um, change in the FAFSA, it, for FAFSA simplification, in the, the FAFSA will, uh, have, will go down from, will, from an estimated 108 questions to a maximum of 36 questions. This is expected to uh, be roll out in the fall of 2022, especially October 1. And they expect three three things to happen in October at that time. Um, that's going to be the same time frame for uh, new formula changes, as well as uh, data sharing with IRS. So a lot of things to look at that are going to transpire in fall 2022, and this would be for the 2023-24 award year. Another thing is that EFC will be no more. It'll EFC will be replaced by something called the Student Aid Index, and the SAI, SAI will be able to go negative, um, as low as minus one thousand five hundred uh, dollars. As you're aware, now the lowest the EFC is zero. Um, the formula will be similar, uh, but but there will be some changes. Uh, for example, uh, it will remove the number of children in college um, from the final formula. Um, we will, uh, we look to, um, we've had some conversations with NASPA and as well as some other and, and, and CAN. Um, they've done a lot of analysis on this. I'm, and I recently sat in on a presentation and um, we have a pending request for them to do a presentation at our annual meeting. So uh, for those that are, that's a little pitch for the annual meeting right there, as well as the fact that um, Mike will be sitting down with a one on one with uh, the current uh, chair of the Education and Workforce Committee, uh, uh, Congressman Scott. 
So for the annual meeting to talk about um, higher ed in this Congress. With that, we will open it up to Q and A. Um, Jay um, asks, is, do we have any reason to speculate there will be an increase in student visa approvals? I'll just say in my own perspective, I'll let Michelle kind of talk as well. I think there will be increased visa um, approvals under this administration. But I think the big question is how long is it going to take for foreign, uh, foreign students to want to come here again in the same number as they previously came? Michelle, your thoughts? Right, I, I would agree. So um, as we did discuss, the, Biden did sign an order directing agency to like review existing policies. So I, I think there is definitely reason to speculate um, how, how that might come about is sort of the question. Um, we're hopeful that there will um, be new guidance allowing new international students to attend online programs um, and hopefully some increase in that portion also um, helping to ensure a more timely processing of visas a number of issues again that we have reached out to the administration urging them to consider um, so hopefully that is are there any other questions or did Michelle and I do such a great job that every quest, every every issue that you guys may have had may was completely covered within the within the the, the, the presentation yeah right now well if there, right there. If, all right well if that's the case one um, just came in oh, somebody yep So, so the question is, um, what are our thoughts on the shift to nationally recognized versus regional national accreditation? Um, it, that's a that's a tricky uh, that's a tricky question. Um, we've kind of, we've looked at this in, in a whole different ways, and we also uh, uh, spoken to other folks. And in many ways, the the feeling is that um, it's going to change, but it's not really going to change um, a lot, but, and that it's going to be like five, six years before or more before um, um, you're really going to see like folks kind of starting to jump all over each other. Um, I mean, we understand the theory behind it, but we we really don't necessarily know how that's all going to all out. Um, so not necessarily, we're kind of, we're kind of just taking a wait and see approach. Right. The goal, you know, the goal is to ideally have institutions that are more similar to be grouped together, um, as opposed to regionally. Um, but, but whether, whether that's how things fall into place and how long it will take for that to fall into place um, is sort of the question which, which is more of a wait and see. And then um, Bill, so Bernadette asked in the chat, she missed the highlights on reverse transfer. So I guess either for you or Michelle, if you'd mind speaking on that um, or repeating it basically. Um, I missed the highlights on reverse transfer. Would you mind speaking on this issue one more time? Yes. So our um, in working with, um, I call him the Yoda of FERPA, Leroy Rooker, um, we came up with language that would essentially um, create an additional exemption under FERPA, which by it's an, an individual that, you know, takes some classes at a community college, but doesn't graduate, transfers uh, to a four year, but doesn't transfer, doesn't, but doesn't graduate. Um, cumulatively, they may have, may have reached 60 credits, but Currently, a four-year institution cannot share uh, that education record with two-year unless the student provides consent. This uh, legislation would allow a four-year to share with a two-year um, the education record specifically for the uh, ability of that two-year to, to review the, uh, the education record and to see if cumulatively between the credits of the two-year 
and the four year, that individual has enough uh, uh, credit to receive a credential or associate's degree from the from the community college. Um, they couldn't, the, the legislation specifically states that um, an institution couldn't um, automatically award the, the degree um, because uh, we we're concerned about, you know, um, creating something that, you know, we have to make sure that the individual wants it. So once that legis once that, in the, that community college completes the review and then says, yes, this individual does have enough credits cumulatively between the two and four year to receive an associate's degree or a credential, they must reach out to the, to the individual and, and say, we've completed this analysis. Are you interested in receiving this credential or associate's degree? So it still maintains with consent regarding FERPA, it just moves it after the evaluation by the community college has been completed. And just to put it in perspective, that legislation um, was included in both versions of HEA reauthorization in the last two Congresses. So, uh, two Congress, the second two Congress ago by the Republican led, it was read, it was in, in, included in markup under um, uh, under consent, and it was part of the Democrats' uh, uh, proposal last year. Um, well, if we don't have any questions, additional questions, um, again, this has been recording. Um, and so I also I want to thank everybody um, for taking the time. We hope that it's, uh, it was helpful, provides you kind of a snapshot of kind of what, what things that we deal with here at ACRO and, and the government relations team. Um, I hope that everybody also enjoyed my dog coming on and letting everybody know that he was very excited about something that was happening outside. And um, we hope to see you virtually at the, um, and the, at the upcoming annual meeting. Michelle? All right. Yes, thanks everyone for your time today. Thanks everybody.